Done. Thank you, Judy. Let's pray. God, speak to us now, for we are listening. You are love. Help us know you better through this time of meditation. As we pray in your name, amen. It's that warm, squishy feeling on the inside. The sun seems just a little bit brighter. Colors pop just a little bit more. You walk around with that feeling of butterflies in your stomach. It's love, right? Have you ever felt that way before? Do you know that kind of feeling of love that I'm talking about? Well, this month, we are going to be spending all of February talking about what it means for us to say as Wimberley United Methodist Church that we are love. We're going to be asking questions like, what is love? Who are we called to love? How do we love? And why do we love? And I think it's extremely appropriate that we start this month by hearing from 1 Corinthians 13, what is arguably and commonly referred to as the love text, our bit of scripture that shows us exactly what love is and why it is so important. It's pretty well known, right? If you've been to a wedding basically ever, you've heard this scripture before. It's what I've heard or actually read at probably 90% of the weddings that I've gone to. And so it's very popular for uh, both the bride and groom to hear and for the congregation to hear when two people are making a covenant vow to themselves. They are going to share that love and engage in that kind of love for each other. And I do love this text. It's so important. It reminds us the importance and position of love above all other spiritual gifts. How it's greater than the speaking of tongues or the interpretation of tongues. How it's greater than the ability to prophesy. How it's greater than having all of the knowledge of the universe and being able to share that knowledge. How it's greater even than the gift of generosity of laying one's own life down for another. If these, if these are done in practice without love, they are nothing. It shows us the characteristics of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant or rude. It isn't self-advantageous or irritable. It doesn't hold grudges. It never rejoices in injustice, but always rejoices in the truth. It bears, trusts, hopes, and endures all things. And brothers and sisters, love never fails. Love is awesome. Love is great. Of course we would want to, as a people of God, hear about and celebrate this kind of love, right? There's only one problem with this, though. This is not the type of love that we talk about most of the time when we talk about love. We have a culture that loves to love, right? We love prolifically. We love widely. We love a lot. I said in the children's talk that we love our parents. I love my wife. I love my children. And also, I love sweet tea. I love chips and queso. How are those things compatible? How is it that I can use that same word to talk about my love for my children and my family, as I used to talk about my love for fried corn chips and cheese dip. It doesn't seem to work well, and yet that's what we do, right? Our culture is one that loves widely, that loves so many people and things that I think sometimes it's hard for us to love deeply. We do, but it's not what we usually mean when we use the word love. But brothers and sisters, the love in 1 Corinthians 13 
is a deep, deep love. It's the love of God. In the Greek language, there are three different words for love. There's eros, which is uh, where we get words like romantic and erotic. This is the love that receives. This is the, the in a way, selfish love. This is the, word, the, the love that um, takes from someone else and um, loves the fact that you are being poured into. It's honestly the love of sweet tea um, in, in a very real way of, I don't love the concept of sweet tea, right? I love actually drinking the sweet tea. I gain from that experience. That's the eros kind of love. Then there's philios or filial love. This is the, the family love or brotherly and sisterly love. Um, this is the, the bond that holds groups of people together, both those of blood relation and otherwise. Um, this is the word where we get things like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And then finally we have agape love, God's love. This is the selfless love. This is the love that doesn't receive but is constantly pouring out into others. This is the love that no matter how much is given, there's still so much more to come. This is how God loves us. And this is the love to which the church is called. The Corinthian church needed to hear this. You see, Corinth at this time was a destination city. It was the place to be. It was a port city, and the market in Corinth was larger even than the market in Athens at this time. Everyone came to Corinth. Everyone wanted to be there, and everyone wanted to be somebody while they were in Corinth. For there was a hierarchy there of the haves and the have-nots, of those who were in the spotlight of popular opinion and those who were pushed into the shadows, of those who enjoyed their privilege and used their privilege to gain even more privilege, and those who didn't have privilege and found that even what they did have was taken from them. Paul actually spent a good deal of time in Corinth and what we hear from Acts and from his letters is that while he was there, he aligned himself not with the cream of the crop, but with the marginalized. So much so that when he left Corinth, this man who was raised a good, upstanding Jew shaved his head and his beard, something that would have been just completely unheard of to show solidarity for the slaves in the slave market. It was to this people that Paul talks about love, that Paul talks about this choice and this decision and this act that removes division and hierarchy, that says nothing else matters if it is not done through love. And this isn't that warm, squishy feeling kind of love. This is the hard kind of love. That's a decision and an action and never a feeling. And Paul makes that clear through how he talks about it, the characteristics that he gives to it, right? Right? to show us just how hard this love can be. In fact, I start tripping up over the very first one. Love is patient. Okay, I've really got to work on that. I can't get any further into the characteristics already because I've got to work on that very first one, and that's hard. In fact, that's the one problem I have with the song we just sang. It's not easy. All we need is love. But this kind of love is hard. It was hard for the people in Corinth. And I think it's hard for us as well. But it's also good. This is the world-changing kind of love. 
This is the kind of love that leaves us as those who pour out better and leaves the world around us better because we have poured out that love. This is the love that caused God to take human form, to live, to die, and to rise again for us. And this is the kind of love that God pours into us that we might pour out into the world. Living into this kind of love is hard. But living into this kind of love is so good. And it's what, as the people of God, we are called to do. So may we love. Not that warm, squishy, feeling inside kind of love that seems to make the sunshine brighter and colors seem more crisp. Not the kind of love that's a feeling at all. But the kind of love that forces us to change how we interact with the world kind of love that makes a difference in our lives and the lives of those around us. May we love with that kind of love. For it's God's love for us. It's God's love for us to use in the world around us. And it's God's love that we should mean when we say we are love. So let's go show that love to Wimberley, to Texas, to our world. Amen.